Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically about the subject of Dead by Daylight's first licensed law archive, Left for Dead's own Bill Overbeck. Since his release in the Left Behind paragraph on the 8th of March 2017, Bill has been one of Dead by Daylight's most popular survivors. At this point, I think it's fair to call Bill an institution of Dead by Daylight. Much like Michael Myers, his presence as a license is one of the game's defining features, almost as much as one of the original characters. But why is that? For starters, he's the first and only licensed character in the game the DVD's player base gets access to for free. While all other licenses, even the semi-original Ghostface, are bound by the terms of the licensing agreement to only be purchasable with real money, Valve stipulated that Bill and Left 4 Dead must never be monetized in Dead by Daylight, so everyone gets him and whatever cosmetics he has without having to spend a penny. He also comes with two of the strongest teachable perks survivors can access, and he also has Left Behind, and until the arrival of Silent Hill and soon Resident Evil, Bill was the only character introduced from another horror video game, and was the first solo licensed character long before Bubba, Ash, or Ghostface joined the cast. In many ways, this old man was quite the trendsetter for licensed characters to come. His longevity in the game has caused him to be a very popular survivor, especially with newer players. The stereotype of a baby Bill so holding a power into you exists because of how beloved he is by newer players, like a male Meghead if you will. And it's only fitting that someone who's been in the game for as long as Bill has, and has become part of his identity to such a degree, should eventually get an archive story. And as part of Tome 7 Forsaken, that's exactly what he got. But how good is the story itself? Can behaviour effectively handle the stories of characters who are not their own? In short, no. No, they kinda can't. At least not in this case, because there's several things deeply wrong with Bill's story, The Long Way Home. If I had to sum up my thoughts on the story in a single word, it would be insincere. But before I explain exactly why, I just want to say I don't have a super close relationship with Left Dead as a franchise, so if I mess things up, or have missed some crucial detail, then please do elaborate in the comments below. This video will also include spoilers for the full story of Left 4 Dead, including the comic The Sacrifice, so be aware of that before watching. So let's talk about The Long Way Home, and to discuss it properly, first we need to establish who Bill Oberbeck is in the first place. Bill Oberbeck's backstory was fairly well established way back when Valve and Turtle Rock Studios released Left 4 Dead on the 17th of November 2008. Bill was a veteran of the Vietnam War, who was honorably discharged after his two tours in the Nam ended with shrapnel injuries to his right knee. He was bored with decades of civilian life upon returning to the United States, until one day he went to a veterans hospital for a routine operation. But as he was put under, one of the surgeons started to act oddly. They became feral, started to rip apart the other staff with their bare hands, and Bill battled through the anesthesia to escape the hospital, and the first of many, many infected that he would have to deal with in the times to come. The Sacrifice comic shows Bill wielding two bone saws as he carves a path through the newly evicted people of Philadelphia to get home, where he donned his old military uniform and prepares to fight off this new threat. And the rest, as they say, is history. Bill met three other survivors, Lewis, Zoe and Francis, who would go on to fight their way through hordes of the infected as they ran from safe zone to safe zone, never leaving one of their own behind. At least, not until the group makes last ditch attempts to escape with the Florida Keys, where their status as asymptomatic carriers of the green flu, the zombie spreading contagion that has struck in the world, would not put others at risk. After accidentally alerting the zombies to their location and tried to raise a bridge, Bill decides to take matters into his own hands and heads out alone to restart a damage generator swarmed by the infected. An ironic prelude of things to come, perhaps. While Bill did get the others to safety and took swaths of the infected down with him, not even he could make it out of that alive. And here's where Dead by Daylight takes over. Because in the realm of the Entity, death is not an escape. The Entity scooped Bill up from his deathbed on the floor of the generator room, like it would go on to do to future characters like Detective David Tapp, Rin Yamaoka and Amanda Young. It gave him a new purpose. Survive against its killers for all eternity. And it's a new existence that builds him to take you like a duck to water. He'd always wanted an enemy to fight ever since his discharge from Vietnam. That's why he thrived so well as a survivor and left for dead. And now that he's got an eternity of battle ahead of him, let's just say those killers won't know what hit them. In fact, 
Bill's presence as a survivor is commonly bemoaned by the player base, because Bill and Left 4 Dead is so badass that behaviour effectively had to nerf him to make him a believable and balanced survivor in Dead by Daylight. He's in the Ash Williams, Cheryl Mason and David Kane category of probably being able to handle almost every killer in the game if they were fully armed. A category that would likely be expanded with whichever survivors were going to get in the Resident Evil chapter, and even without his traditional M16 rifle, he could probably handle any killer of maybe Trapper's weight class or below by himself. Like, he'd probably be fine with Charlotte on her own, but he'd probably lose to Charlotte and Victor together if that makes sense. So, Bill's a grizzled veteran of both Vietnam and the Green Flu outbreak, capable of kicking ass and taking names, despite his advanced age and knee injury. He loves a good scrap, and is restless without something to fight, and feels a deep bond with Lewis, Francis, and especially Zoe, at the cost of basically everyone and everything else. So how is that carried over into The Long Way Home? When the Forsaken Tome trailer came out, almost all the emphasis was placed on Bill. The plague in The Observer got a little bit of a showing, but the trailer spent almost all its runtime showing off that we were getting our first ever licensed archive tome. Nothing wrong with that, it's a milestone for sure, but I'm more interested in what the trailer actually showed us. Between the jungle setting and the depiction of Bill as a younger man, with no grey in his hair and no limp slowing him down, it's clear this was meant to show Bill during his years of service in Vietnam, even though a lot of people pointed out that his gear looks more Desert Storm than Tropic Thunder. Regardless, this led many people, myself included, to believe that we were going to see something genuinely out of left field from Bill's tome, some depiction of his time in the Nam. This is something that Valve had never explored before, and would have given us a great opportunity to see Bill thrive in his natural habitat of combat without the other three Left 4 Dead survivors competing for the spotlight. We could have been shown why Bill is so well suited to warfare, maybe even seen the injury that got him sent home in the first place. Not only that, it suggested that the younger look of Bill that we'd seen was going to be the skin we would get from the Rift, but that's not even close to what we actually received. The Bill skin we got has him as old as ever, with combat gear so drenched in blood that it looks like a marginally changed version of prestige cosmetics, and the story that came with it was even more different. Instead of a story of Bill's time in Vietnam, we got a story set during the Green Flu outbreak, just before the events of Left 4 Dead, depicting Bill's first encounters with the other survivors. This is what I mean by the whole thing feeling insincere. The marketing promises a look back into Bill's history to really show us what makes him tick, but the actual story seems afraid to do that, in favour of retreading the relationships that were already implied through voice lines and interactions in Left 4 Dead itself. Not that one is inherently worse than the other, mind you, it's just that we didn't get what the advertising for the tome promised us. Maybe this is the result of a last minute change somewhere. Maybe Behaviour had a story about Bill in Vietnam ready to go, but Valve pulled the plug at the last minute or something. Don't take my word for it, this is just a stab in the dark to try to explain something that I don't fully understand. But that isn't the only reason I'm calling the story insincere. The marketing behind the tome isn't the only problem. It also presents a picture of Bill and his friends that doesn't really feel organic to the world of Left 4 Dead, and that is a far more dire sin because way easier to ignore deceitful marketing than it is to ignore an entire cast of established characters, especially when what you're promising is an adaptation and continuation of their existing stories. For the uninitiated, Left 4 Dead's main cast of survivors is comprised of the war veteran Bill, the fatalistic biker Francis, the horror movie aficionado Zoe, and the change optimist Lewis. The story covers Bill's first encounters with each of his fellow survivors, starting with Zoe, then Francis, and finally Lewis. And let me just start off by saying, Lewis got robbed by this story. Not only is he barely introduced in the first place and just crops up whenever there's a convenient pause in the action for him to slide in, but the moment establishes his character is frankly a travesty. Anyone who's played Left 4 Dead could tell you what kind of person Lewis is. He's intelligent, optimistic, quick-witted, kind of nerdy, probably the least well-suited of the group to surviving a zombie apocalypse in the first place, but gets by all the same because he adapts well to the challenges ahead of him. Think of what Dwight tried to be except actually written successfully. But in The Long Way Home, he's none of those things. All he is is not a hacker, and a big deal's made about his tie, but that's really it. It's such a surface level, flat depiction of a character who I think deserved a lot better. Fortunately, not every character is treated so badly by the writers. Zoe gets by far the best treatment out of the whole cast, as she gets the most focus apart from Bill, as well as the most depth. A lot of the same themes and ideas used for the Sacrifice comic are showcased here, such as Zoe and Bill's father-daughter-esque relationship, 
and her faith in the ability of others to save them that Bill does not share. She's both a consummate fighter in her own right as she battered the survivalist who has them prisoner, and the devil-headed voice of reason as Francis and Bill screw off with each other over Francis's trademark Merry Christmas quip. Speaking of which, let's talk about Francis. I have very mixed opinions about Francis's presence in this story. He kind of sums up my thoughts on the whole thing, both positively and negatively, extremely well. Whoever wrote this story got the images of Left 4 Dead and the dynamics between the characters dead on. Ideas like the safe houses, the presence of Cedar, and Francis's cutting remarks about ties and Canada helped to ground the story in the world of Left 4 Dead, and Francis, more than any other character in the story, spit some of his most iconic lines basically copy-pasted from the game. From the perspective of a Left 4 Dead fanatic, this story looks very loyal to the game. But the emphasis here is on looks. The more you think about the implications and actual language of the story, the more you realise that this isn't an extension of Left 4 Dead's world, but more like a fan fiction written by someone whose love for the game and its world eclipses what they're trying to write. Take the history behind the Merry Christmas line, for example. On the surface of it, it adds a neat bit of context to Francis's trademark catchphrase. If you look a little deeper, you realise that now it just makes less sense than it ever did. Francis saying Merry Christmas always made sense, it never needed an explanation because Francis always saw post-green flu life as a party to begin with. What did he do when it all broke out? He stole a jukebox with some friends and spent a while blowing off zombie heads with shotguns and drinking booze. When Francis treats his whole life like a holiday, Merry Christmas feels like a natural greeting for him. But Bill never had that laid-back attitude, he was always very business-like. So why does he say it in the first place? Francis got it from Bill, apparently, but where did Bill get it from? By trying to explain something that didn't need explaining, The Long Way Home ironically creates more perplexing questions than the ones it actually tries to answer. Same goes for when Bill discusses being a carrier, and their eventual destination to an island in the Florida Keys. These ideas not even brought up until the Sacrifice comic at the end of Left 4 Dead storyline, yet here they are being brought up at the very start of their time together. The notion of them being carriers doesn't even start with Bill in the main canon in the first place. It starts with a government scientist working on isolating the carriers. Again, the more you think about the story, the less sense it starts to make. From the outside, it feels like this story was written by someone who genuinely loves Left 4 Dead and wants to show all their favourite characters doing all their favourite characters' things. Bill being a hard-bitten leader who doesn't take no shit, Francis being a snarky bastard, Zoe being the emotional glue of the team, and Lewis barely existing because nobody likes Lewis anywhere near as much as they should. Perhaps written by someone who loves Left 4 Dead a little too much. Obsessed with showing off their favourite characters, ideas and catchphrases at the cost of everything else. Again, this story reads a lot like a fan fiction. Maybe there's some truth to the idea that this tone was changed from a Vietnam story at the last moment. That would certainly explain some of the inconsistencies and issues with it that slipped through the net. But if you ask me, the biggest hint that all with this story was not smooth sailing is the language used. Compared to the high quality of the language in all the recent tomes, The Long Way Home feels archaic. Like it was a slapdash translation straight from French, like a lot of behaviours older writing. The author's voice is incredibly inconsistent. It seems to drift between the florid writing, the purple prose typical of the Observer tomes, and the gruff, short sentences of Bill's own internal voice. Sometimes in the middle of a sentence, and that can make the story really hard to sink your teeth into because there's no tonal consistency. Are we in Bill's head, limited by his perspective and seeing the world through his eyes? Or are we seeing it in a wider, less personal perspective like the Observer, as he watches the vista of Bill's memories unfold in front of him? This is a balance that behaviour has only gotten better and better with over time as the tomes have gone on. The Plague and Nurse stories both had a really solid tonal consistency that made them well composed stories to the core. Even the individual vocabulary choices make my brain ache sometimes, but I just don't know why they picked them. Beaucoup fierce? Excuse me, is Bill French now? Or is this just a phrase that more English speaking people use that I've never heard anyone who speaks English use? Another example, right at the start, feels like now I'm all over again. One minute you're drifting off to some faraway dreamland, the next you're fighting off a surgeon in a strange, foggy half nightmare. Forgive me if I'm being a bit slow, but 
how would those particular feelings, anything like service in the Vietnam War? Was a faraway dreamland a commissary of affairs for US special forces serving in Vietnam? Were surgeons known to be the Viet Cong's most fearsome combatants? I'm not saying drawing comparisons between Bill's life in uniform and his life as a survivor is a bad thing by itself, but I do think the comparisons the story chooses to draw, and how it draws them, are pretty weak. The sentences feel disjointed from one another, the narrative doesn't feel natural. Not to mention how some of the syntax just reads poorly, in a way that drags you out of the story with just how jarring it is. Bill raises an inspired eyebrow. Um. In what way can an eyebrow itself be inspired? Does the hair above his eye suddenly have an incredible idea, struck with a flash of genius? But my favourite, my absolute special favourite of language just not being used convincingly is how Bill describes Lewis in his internal monologue about him. Geek has spunk and attitude. I... I just don't even know where to begin. Okay, I lied, I absolutely do. First, the two words mean literally the same thing in this context, so they're redundant descriptors regardless of anything else. Second, I can't imagine Bill, a grizzled, no-nonsense man of action, seriously refer to someone that way, especially in their own internal monologue. Bill saying someone's got spunk is like John McClane saying someone's got pizzazz. It just doesn't really fit the character. And third, that's not even an accurate observation from the situation that Lewis and Bill are in in the first place, because all Lewis has done to earn this praise from Bill is to tell people that he's not a hacker. The description's not only redundant and out of character, but also inaccurate, which just highlights how totally meaningless these interactions are and how completely devoid of purpose Lewis is treated in the story. This is what I mean when I said that The Long Way Home felt like a fan fiction or that it felt rushed, like proper care wasn't taken to edit this story. Say what you will about the quality of most of the other time stories, even the ones I vehemently dislike are mostly works written with actual care, except the hag's law that can go to hell. This is even true with the nurse's time story. While I was greatly disappointed with how Sally was treated, I could at least respect the craftsmanship that went into making it. I could understand it as a coherent piece of literature, even if I didn't like the end result. This... This doesn't feel like it had the same amount of time, care or dedication put into making it as good as it could be. The Long Way Home, to me, feels incomplete, like a shadow of what it could have been. This is why I'm still entertaining the idea that part of this time was rushed out or changed at the last minute. Because this is some important lore they've just half cooked and pushed into the world. It's their first ever licensed story, and it doesn't set the greatest precedent for things to come. Bill getting a story opens the door for future licensed characters to get their stories told in the archives, so you'd think they'd want to get it right. But with the missteps in the written story and the gulf between what was advertised and what we received, makes me think there was some sort of production disaster somewhere along the line, that meant they had to change tack at the last minute. I'm not saying we know that to be true or anything, but if it is, that's kinda sad. As I said earlier, Bill is an institution of this game. His tome should be special, and yet it's about as far from special as it's possible to get. In terms of the archives to come, we don't know for certain if we're going to get more tome stories about licensed characters in the future. If you ask me, the most likely candidate by far to get a future licensed archive story would be Ghostface, since he's partially an original character by behaviour anyway, and Fumworld is so liberal with the license and surprised he hasn't already got one at this point. As for the others, it would depend entirely on how amicable the license holder would be with behaviour. Some licenses, like Silent Hill and Stranger Things, have shown themselves to be very generous with what behaviour lets them do, so we're much more likely to see Rift Cosmetics and archive stories about them in the future. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have A Nightmare on Elm Street, a license so fraught with implementation issues and a long-running legal argy-bargy with the Craven Estate that it took years to even get Freddy onto all platforms. Something tells me we're getting nothing new from that license anytime soon, if ever again. All we know is that the next one coming in Tome 8 is going to be featuring two original characters, Jake Park and the Clown, so we'll be getting no new license law for a little while, but we can hope But when it does come back, maybe with Ghostface, Cheryl Mason, or the Stranger Things crew. Behaviour has a clear and strong creative direction that's just as good as their original content, if not better. Because if the Left 4 Dead story is any indication, that's not how the forecast is looking. As much as The Long Way Home is probably a very satisfying story for avid Left 4 Dead fans who missed the old Survivor team, I can't help but struggle to hack through its hedge maze of bizarre language and strange questions that were never meant to be asked. Let's hope with whatever licensed story Behaviour decides to do next, 
They really put the effort in at all stages to do it justice, because the concept, regardless of implementation here, is good and could work really well. Fingers crossed that they follow through on the potential that these stories have, and that the tantalising possibilities of licensed lore to come don't get left behind. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you enjoyed it, then please leave a comment complaining about whatever it is you want, or subscribe if you feel so inclined. You can check the description to find all of my socials, including my Twitter, my Discord, and my Twitch stream, as well as my Patreon if you're feeling particularly generous. With the Resident Evil reveal coming up next week, I'm going to be taking content at a slightly different pace. The normal deep dive that I had planned has been pushed back, so I'm making a few smaller videos just to buy the time until Resident Evil comes out. The first one I'm working on is actually going to be a retrospective to look back on my own Resident Evil video that, that I put out less than a week before the official Resident Evil announcement, confirming me as an absolute wizard. I'll be re-evaluating what I said in that video and considering other options with the information that we already have. In addition, I have a video plan that I've been looking at for quite some time that I've had many suggestions to make. I've put it off for ages, but I think now is the right time to bring it out. If you're interested to see what it's going to be, then please do subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and you'll be sure not to miss it. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Ta-ta for now.